Hello, and welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm your host this evening, Brian Broom, and I'm joined by Greg Uttinger. Today we'll be talking about a buzzword that needs to be rightfully reclaimed from the category of buzzing, (laughs) which is unity, and also love, and one that we need to put back into its proper place of respect, which is truth. Truth is something that is not in vogue in modern society and potentially in any pagan society throughout all of history. Uh, So, Greg, with that sort of lead in, why don't you get us started? (laughs) That leaves so many openings. Um, (laughs) Well, Well, you know me, I like to give options. (laughs) Let's continue with the historical flow that we've been doing, but we we really could just pick up any verse in the Bible. Actually, we could pick up the Bible and just go from there, but let's let's do this first. This is um, 2 Chronicles 19, verse 1. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Anani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore wrath is upon thee from before the Lord. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, and that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land, and has prepared thine heart to seek God. The uh, context is a battle led by King Ahab of Israel, the northern kingdom, to reclaim an outpost called Ramoth Gilead. Ramoth Gilead. It was, the Syrians had commandeered it, were using it as a place to uh, wage attacks, and when Jehoshaphat, the king from the south, is visiting, that in itself is something we have to talk about, uh, Ahab says, does anyone notice that Ramoth and Gilead is ours and we do nothing to take it back? Shouldn't we go do something? And he looks at Jehoshaphat of Judah and says, will you go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat answers, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. Now, to get read that, I had to skip over the first verse, which says, Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance and joined affinity with Ahab. Affinity. I didn't know until recently what that word actually means. I mean, affinity, obviously, you're you're making some kind of league or or contract or deal or friendship. It actually has a very precise meaning. It means to give your child to another monarch's child to create a marriage that will seal a covenantal unity between the two families and the two kingdoms. So this is the point where Jehoshaphat, the king of the south, is taking for his son, Athaliah, the daughter of Jezebel and uh, Ahab in the north, so as to bind these two kingdoms closely together. And Jehoshaphat's son, uh, Jehoram, will take Athaliah back, and she he will be the future king, and she will be the future queen when godly Jehoshaphat's off the out of the scene. Oh my. You had your finger up. I thought there was more than a oh my coming. <laughs> I mean, the first thing that comes by is there are, well, let's see, we're in Kings now. Is that right? Well, Kings, um, and, Kings and Chronicles is in both Kings places. and Chronicles. We are a very, like, I don't remember exactly which number of books Chronicles yeah. is off the top of my head, but we are that many books into reasons why this is a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> Starting with Genesis. <laughs> well, you know, technically in the Hebrew ordering of the canon, the Second Chronicles is actually the last book. Oh, so it's the entire Old Testament <laughs> at saying least way, this is a bad idea. Yeah, at least the way that, that the uh, editors arranged it uh, for the Jews. Um, anyway, anyway yeah, this has been going on that. for a long time. But the, the thing – so anyway, the battle. The two nations join forces. They go to Ramoth Gilead. After being warned by one of God's prophets not to do this and encouraged by all the false prophets, oh yeah, this will be a great idea. Mm. Ahab dies in battle and uh, everybody goes home. And that's when the scene that we read about happens. That's such a that's such a great description. Ahab dies in battle and then everyone goes home. Yeah, it's pretty much pretty much it. Um, and one of the, the prophets out of Judah, a man named uh, Jehu, the son of Anani, not to be confused with another Jehu who's, who's going to show up before too long. 
comes out and says flat out to the king, shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore there is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Now let us note how many ways this isn't going to play in most modern churches today. Hmm. First of all, of course you love the ungodly. Isn't that what it's all about? Should uh, you, you speak of them hating the Lord? They don't even know the Lord. You're being too absolute, too black and white, too harsh in your in in your condemnation. They're, they're strangers to the Lord. They they don't know their need, but surely you can't speak of them hating the Lord. And then third, therefore wrath is upon thee from before the Lord. Now, now there's your way over life. It's not that God, even if Jehoshaphat made some kind of honest mistake here, God would hardly be angry to the point it be, could be described as wrath. No, I don't know where you got this. No, you obviously no, made this verse up. Yeah, God is love. Yes, God is love. And as such, an ushy gushy acceptance of all things, as he pleads desperately for us to see things his way. Well, even that's a little harsh on God's part. Yeah, if, if we can just invite him along on our picnic, uh, he promises to be good and, and, and God's, bless God's really aloof. He just wants to. He just wants to take charge of our spreadsheets and make sure everything <laughs> comes out in the black. And that's yeah. that's about it. He wants he, to he's, bless he's, us. Yeah, he's really fine with whatever we're we're wanting to do already. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be so harsh and condemning, judgy of God to. We know that none of that has anything to do with love, and God is love, right? First principles, God is love, as I conceive of it. And um, from there, this verse just doesn't wash. This is obviously the God of the Old Testament, or just a plain scribal error or something that never should have got in there in the first place. And we can continue this facetiousness all we want because it's so easy, because we don't have to go very far to find examples of it in the 20th century, 21st century church. 20th century church for that matter, or even sometimes the 19th century church. You don't have to go far to see people err, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, what do we say about this? Well, well, well first of all, we, we need to talk about this word love. He, the prophet pairs helping the ungodly with loving those that hate the Lord. First of all, well, I don't know where we should start. We probably should start with this ungodly and hate thing. Ungodly and hating the Lord. Um, there is a bland assumption. I, I, I never see it discussed or, or brought out, except under one particular circumstance. There's an assumption that, that, as I said, that people don't hate God. They, they just don't know God. They have desperate needs in their life. And the Gospels show them how God, how Jesus can make up those needs. About the only time that this thing is ever flushed to the surface is when you start talking about the heathen who have never heard of the Lord, and you're so, well, obviously God can't condemn them because they can't be God's enemies. They've never even heard of him. They don't hate the Lord. They don't, you know, that's nice mythology, but it's not at all what, what God says. We could back up to the, as I said, we could pick anything in the Bible anywhere and start there. God speaks as absolute sovereign with the assumption that all men know who he is and are, coven are in covenant with him. They're either covenant breakers or covenant keepers. They're either saved or lost. They either hate him or love him. And that there is no in between. No man stands neutral before God. And therefore, if you do not love God, you hate God. I remember asking mm -hmm. a dear lady who worked at our school about her... Uh, about her coming to Christ and such. And I, I pointed out that, you know, before you came to Christ, you hated God. She said, I didn't hate God. I, 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 didn't, I didn't think of it that way. Did you love him with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength so that you renounced your will to do everything? He, well, no, not as such. No, oh, that. And, and she came for the first time to understand that in coming to Christ, she'd left a life of hating God, Christ, the gospel, and all of that although she had never even admitted it to herself. And yet the Bible keeps insisting on this. And we can also just think of it in, in terms of comparison is there, there is a being who gives you your every breath mm -hmm. and who sustains your very molecular structure with the word of his power and mm -hmm. also the ground that you're walking on with its molecules are held together <laughs> and uh, the planet you're walking on and <laughs> the trees that you're looking at and everything he he does all of this, and it, it's very gracious of him to continue doing this. 
in comparison with that kind of love in in at least a limited sense of the term this that provision he, that he does good to people he does good to people the rain falls on the just and the unjust yeah. with all of that in mind ambivalence towards someone who has been this gracious to you in a purely physical and temporal sense is hateful <laughs> it is it is uh, without gratitude unthankful hateful and of course our culture doesn't see it that way we rather see that well god to be good has to do these things so it's just his way of doing stuff and so he should be him and we should be me and he shouldn't just because he does all this good stuff doesn't mean he gets to tell me what to do or anything i mean that would be imposing upon my individuality my autonomy myself mm -hmm. i gotta be me isn't that the most important thing you know, no, it's not. <laughs> and there just are a lot of people who don't get that, and a lot of them will carry the name of Christ. I think that Christianity is there to make them feel good about themselves. I think we both used the phrase uh, therapeutic deism before. Probably. God, God is there just to make our lives easier, make us feel good about ourselves, uh, bless us when we get in trouble, rescue us when we get in danger. And otherwise, he doesn't really demand a whole lot of us, nor should he. Because we have our own lives to live after all. He's really just there to make sure that, you know, society cohesives together yeah. and uh, that we have ni nice people in courts and, and, and uh, legislative positions who are amenable to us and will make sure that people are nice to us. Yeah. And again, we get to define what nice is. And you can tell what nice is by um, reading Google or the latest opinion polls. The Atlantic. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I also want to, before we move on, just draw our attention as well, unsurprisingly, to Romans 1, mm, where yes. it, it says, For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely his inter eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Without that excuse. is the. Well, the, the natural revelation of, of yeah. the world lets them know God exists and lets them yeah. know that the true God exists as much yes. as they try to explain it away through other environmental means, demonic influence, etc. They they know this. And, you, you know, you, you get people who are unbelievers and they go like, well, that's ridiculous. They don't they don't have a knowledge they don't they don't have book knowledge of who this god is you can't say that they're guilty before the god that whose gospel they haven't even heard well they can because you're you're living on god's earth it's obvious when i mean well i like what you you were saying they don't have book knowledge no they are the book God has <laughs> imposed his own image upon them. them. More than that, they are. It's not just something peripheral or, or, or on the uh, the outside, an, an impress. They are the image of God. To reject, to deny the existence of the God whose image they are is to reject and to deny themselves. They're, there's no way it's out also of that quandary. To, it's also to reject like uh, sens sensibility, basically. Yeah. it it's. The ultimate self-defeating paradigm. Um, I think yeah. that Lewis does a really good job of displaying that in his in his space trilogy. Whenever Weston shows up uh, in the first two books and mm -hmm. um, through the NICE and that hideous strength, I, I've only just started reading it for the third time uh, <laughs> to my wife. So like, and the, the time before this, it's been like four years. So uh -huh. <laughs> some of the details are fuzzy, but in all the descriptions from um, Feverstone. When he when he's first broaching the topic with uh, the, one of the main characters, Mark, about yeah. joining the National Institute of Coordinated Ex Coordinated Experiments, it's all about man taking control over nature and getting rid of the old way of life and death and all that. And right. That's Lewis was really really insightful and brilliant in that he recognized this is the end result of rejecting God, even if there's a lot of comparatively nicer uh, milestones along the way. Mm -hmm. You can look at, you know, 
Cartesian ra- rationalism and be like, this is nicer than that. And it's like, yeah, but it's not nice. <laughs> yeah. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> or he- Hegelian, um, I forgot the word for it, but you know. Synthesis, Hegel. relativism. Yeah. Yeah. So the Bible claims from, from the moment it opens, but the very fact of having words on its text, it's saying, here is truth over against non-truth. Here's reality over against all your imaginations. Here is the God. And I, by the way, I appreciate before that you said that uh, creation reveals God, the God. Yeah. Um, not, not some God later to be named, some hypothetical God that we can debate over. No, it's, it's the one true God that man is at war with. And if you crack open the Bible and put your finger down anywhere, you, you have his voice speaking to you, and you're immediately called to decision. Will you submit yourself to what he has said, whether it's a statement, a commandment, or a promise, or will you rebel and try to make yourself the judge of Scripture? Um, and two, like when, when God puts his divine revelation into words that anyone can read, not only does he leave a testament for all time, mm-hmm. a testament to his existence, to his nature and his promises, but he's also saying uh, in, a, in a more abstract sense, come to this, look at it, and then make your judgment. Mm-hmm. Because if divine revelation is just throughout all time there's never anything written down it's just you're waiting for the the inner divine spark of the spirit to speak mm-hmm. to you and that's your truth for this generation for your for your life and what whatever then there's no way to determine the truthfulness of it yeah because ultimate the ultimate reality that is in div, in divine revelation is and should be like we shouldn't look at things and go like, oh, well, I guess it contradicts what we see in scripture. Oh, well, no. <laughs> if, we, if we come across something, you know, Paul says, if this gospel isn't true, if Christ be not dead, then we are above all men most to be pitied. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's, it's a, a fairly large hypothetical. Um, yeah. And one of, the, one of the things too is like with um, an ev- evidentialist approach, I find evidentialism generally helps the believer most because yes. you can look at everything and say, wow, look at all of this and how well I'm going to use the word cohese again. Look how well it all coheses, yes. or cohedes. I don't know the actual Because <laughs> we expect it to be logical. We expect it to fit. And when it does, we say, see? Yes. <laughs> but, the, but the man who hates God doesn't see. Yeah. He, he, he accuses us of using our imaginations or making things up or or – breaking the puzzle pieces so that they fit despite the fact that they mm. obviously couldn't. Anyway, this 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 was just to get us to this um the, the first proposition here. Yes. Um this ungodly and those that hate the Lord. So when we face humanity, we are looking at two categories, those who hate God, those who fear the Lord, who love the Lord. And what the prophet, and so our next step, the prophet connects two things. The the godly, those who fear the Lord, who love the Lord, should not help or love those who hate God. Now, when we were talking beforehand, we, we both kind of did the, well, there is, yes, there is a sense, obviously, in which you love the unbeliever. And that sense is real simple. Call him to repentance. Point out that he's wrong. Do it gently. Do it humbly. But say, you know what? This thing you say, this thing you believe, this thing you do, mm-hmm. is contrary to God's law. It's contrary to his word. Mm-hmm. It's contrary to reality. And for a Christian who, who gives it a moment's thought, this should obviously be seen as love. You know, if you're about to inject yourself with a deadly poison, if you're about to walk <laughs> off a roof, if you're about to uh, accelerate toward the brick wall in your uh, in your car, and someone says, stop, that's bad, the person who told you that loves you, is trying to help you. Yes, that's a good kind of thing. But when we transfer it to the spiritual realm, because we never settled the first part, because Religion and theology and ethics are all a matter of my opinion versus your opinion. Nobody gets to call it. Nobody has a final answer. If you tell me I'm bad, 
If you tell me I'm wrong, if you tell me this is going to hurt me and others, then you are unloving, you are judgmental, mm. you have set yourself over against me and are trying to enslave me to your standard of morality and to your version of truth, to your story. And I do not appreciate your attempts to enslave me thus. Obviously, you hate me. Now, if you love me, you'd get on board with my vision, with my way of doing things. At the very least, you'd be quiet, but that's probably not enough anymore. You probably need to actually help me do what I'm doing. And helping means not only in your own person, but lobbying the government to finance what I'm doing. And everyone else is doing something likewise, because otherwise you're hateful, judgmental, and you're the Think enemy. If you're, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Yeah. And so that's where we've come, where love means total acceptance, total cooperation, even if we as Christians say, but that's bad, that's wrong, God says it's wrong, yet we feel that somehow we're not being loving if we don't, to some extent, try to get on their bandwagon. And, and to some, something you that's been hinted at in what you've said, I just want to bring it out more explicitly, mm -hmm. is that within this context, the, the specificity of what it means to help someone who hates the Lord, who is set against Yahweh, um, it's it's uh, at least to me. I'm going to weigh this against a verse in the in the New Testament as well. Mm -hmm. It seems to be specifically in regards to helping them with the things they're doing that are setting themselves against Yahweh, mm -hmm. the things that are sinful. Because we we even are told in, um, and of course the reference is completely going to escape me, but we're told you know if you give a cup of cold water to someone in my name, right. then that it, you know this is a very poor Brian's paraphrase. It's a good thing that you do that, <laughs> and that verse doesn't necessarily limit it to those yeah. in the household of faith. It's to everyone. That is a practical need that you're helping fulfill in the name of Christ. It's it's a part of your. It's a component of the greater evangelistic vision. It's not because we're not Gnostics. One, right. uh, we can ring the Gnosticism bell. Um, mm. In we're not the, Gnostics, so we can say, look, I'm helping you with water. We're not yeah. just saying, hey, you need Jesus, be warmed and be filled, and then you go <laughs> on your way. When Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount about loving our own enemies, which are not necessarily his, I've got to be careful there. But when he defined that, he said, I say, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, there, there is a way in which we are to love even unbelievers, even people who persecute us. It doesn't mean that we have to hold the sword while they ram it into us, but it does mean <laughs> that we can pray for them, pray for their souls, pray for their repentance. Mm -hmm. the, uh, we all know the passage, love your neighbor as yourself, but the place where it occurs is this thou this is Leviticus uh, 19 verse 18 thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself but if you go back a verse it says this thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart thou shalt any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him so bracketed between don't hate your brother and love your brother is and if he's sinning don't let him go on sinning tell him he's sinning help him stop um, and, and, and so as we're faced with unbelievers, enemies of God, yes, we pray for them, we bless them, which is to say we pray God's blessing upon them, which means regeneration, repentance, and faith in Christ. We do good to them. They've fallen down of a heart attack. We throw them in the car and take them to the hospital. Yep. We pray for them. I remember listening to... I'm sorry to throw off your train of thought. That's fine. I used to listen to Fighting for the Faith with Chris Roseberg, who is a confessional Lutheran. Mm -hmm. And I found it very interesting because he said, he's like, I'm a, I'm a Lutheran pastor. One of the things that I've thought ahead on is I keep bottles of water in my car mm -hmm. in, in the glove compartment, not to drink. But that's so that if I come across someone who's been in an accident, 
I can evangelize them, and then I'm a pastor. I can also baptize them if they <laughs> consent. <laughs> oh, you is... got me. I was waiting for a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. That's great. <laughs> well, in, in a sense, I mean, baptism is giving a cup of cold oh, water. Well, mm, yeah. Okay. That's a new light on that one. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, I always found that interesting. It stuck with me. I haven't listened to an episode in like five years, but yeah, probably more than that. You know, Lutherans have a different idea on sacraments than reform do, but it's a, uh, it, it, if you're a Lutheran, that is a way to love your neighbor in an evangelistic yeah. situation where they are near death. It makes perfect sense. <laughs> hey, I got no problem with that as, as a, a good Calvinist, you know? No, me neither. Uh, um, Philip uh, asked the, the eunuch, you, you believe Jesus is the Son of God? I do. Well, here's water. Let's get it done. Let's do it. <laughs> um, what prohibits me? What prohibits me from being baptized? Yeah. So anyway, so so far what we've seen in this passage in Chronicles, which I just lost, there it is, is Jehoshaphat on two fronts had helped Ahab of Israel, Ahab the Baal worshiper. He had united their families by marriage, and he had joined him in war. Now it goes probably shared it, some meals, and so, yeah, there were sharing of meals as well as sharing of future progeny, what happens after that is uh, after Ahab's death, uh, Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat joins uh, Ahab's heir in a maritime adventure, uh, but God destroys their ships. And then the next son, Ahab's next son comes to the throne, and Jehoshaphat joins him in a campaign to subdue Moab and uses the same language, I am as you are, my people is your people, my horses is your horses, and, 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 and so on. He doesn't quite, it takes him a long, long time to get it. I think there's one more incident where he finally says, no. <laughs> so somewhere in this, he does say no at the end. Meanwhile, though, Jehoshaphat's son, Jehoram, marries Athaliah. Jehoram dies. His son, Isaiah, comes to the throne. So his mother's in the background, you know, the spider pulling all the webs. And then he dies, and we're going to talk next time, I think, about the whole conflagration that happens when a different Jehu comes in and just kills everyone vaguely related to Ahab in the north. Uh, this Athaliah, this daughter of Jezebel, who's now queen in the south, goes into the royal nursery and seeing no child apparently who is her own, kills them all. These are the children of the Davidic kingdom, the Davidic mm -hmm. line. And she sets out to kill every single child who could be an ancestor of Messiah and nearly succeeds. And we will talk a good deal about this later. The nurse and the princess manage to spirit away one little boy, one infant, who's raised secretly in the temple. The point now, though, is Jehoshaphat, by blessing this marriage, arranging for it, creating this union, put a Athaliah in a place where she could very nearly destroy the promise of Messiah. If it weren't for God's providence and God's overruling wisdom and sneakiness, that would have been it. As far as on the last day, Jehoshaphat could have stood before the world and said, yep, I destroyed the promise of Messiah all by myself because I wanted to play uh, Yentl to my uh, my son and and bring the two kingdoms together and that's what we have to see here. His why, why is he doing this stupid thing? Because he can look at both north and south and say, but we're both the people of God. We both have the promises. We have the same Bible. God's still sending prophets up there. He obviously hasn't abandoned them. Yeah, they mm. have this whole worship God through golden calf things, but. You know, I'm sure in their hearts, it's God that they I love. I can change them. I can change them. But how can I change them if we're always at a distance and we're always fighting wars? Let's get some unity going on here, and then we can begin to make some headway. And I'll set the president by even joining our two families together. Won't this be wonderful? And he almost destroys the world. It's an amazing thing. Hmm. That said, let's fast forward about a thousand years, to um, the early 1900s in the United States. In 1908, saw the creation of the Federal Council of Churches. We've had a number of organizations that have come in the wake of it or extended off of it. 
But this, this was the first time when in America, churches, both evangelical and liberal, decided that somehow they could forge some kind of external unity, which would somehow be a blessing to the church, make her stronger, more significant in the eyes of the world, have more political leverage, uh, a greater sparkle and smile before a watching world. It would be good. They just, the evangelicals would just have to be quiet about a few things. And the mm. liberals would have to be nice and not be too hypercritical. But surely one external church would be a whole lot better than dozens and dozens of individual denominations who can't get along, right? So let's just do this thing and it'll be great. I mean, honestly, it just sounds like a Protestant attempt at Roman Catholicism. <laughs> and Roman Catholicism is just as fractured and just as yeah. disunified as uh, Protestantism supposedly is. Yeah, it's... it's yeah. <laughs> And so we find in our day a lot of people going back to Rome because at least they have prettier churches. And, <laughs> um, of course, what what liberals found as they looked at uh, conservatives who weren't thrilled about this was that conservatives, evangelicals, kept claiming to have this thing they called truth, that there were particular doctrines that were true, true in an absolute sense. And not only true, but therefore important. It wasn't. It was bad enough that they claimed that they were true, in in the sense of two plus two is four is true. Um, but they they claimed that they could not give them up. In fact, that's the one reason that these each denomination existed was because they had always believed this truth, and they part of their existence was to defend and preserve this truth. Interestingly enough, a lot of these evangelicals had the same truths, you know, things like the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, the literal second coming, cre uh, special creation, um, you know, blood atonement, and yes, some other things that they didn't agree on, like the, the mode of baptism, a form of church government, things like that. But the liberals looked at this and said, can't you just get over it? Isn't the, isn't the cause of Christ more important than your individual pride in your ancestors' accomplishments. Can't we just all get along and it'll be so much better? And kind of like at the start of this podcast, the answer is yes, depending on what you're talking <laughs> about in particular. Yes. Now, if you're talking about whether we use hymnals or projector screens, okay, maybe we got something we can talk about. Organs versus pianos. I don't know. Some denominations might die over that one. Classes but, versus um, Presbytery. Presbytery. You know. Yeah. But when we start talking about Jesus is the eternal son of God versus he's not. There's not really much negotiation <laughs> on that point. Yeah. One of the, uh, the liberal critics uh, at this time, his name was uh, uh, Dean Shaler Matthews, said this about Nicaea. If the Council of Nicaea, instead of wasting weeks over the discussion of a word had organized a mission society to go into Germany, what a different story history would have told. How terrible that this woman has spilled the expensive <laughs> perfume on our Lord's feet instead uh, yeah. <laughs> of selling it and giving the money to the poor. Yes, yes. Now, here it was something even more crucial. Of course, the word he's talking about is homoousian versus homoousian. Is Jesus uh, a partaker of the divine nature? Is he God? Or is he really, really like God? And every liberal knows the difference between the two. They just like to pretend. Since they don't believe any of it, they can deny all of it equally. And they can say, here you're debating about words that we don't even believe in in the first place, when you could be sending out missionary societies into, into the German pagans and teach them not to kill it. Wait, no, wait, 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 wait. So we're not going to be, we're not going to agree who, on who or what Jesus is. Whether he's God or a nice man or an alien or the peak of human evolution or whatever, we're not going to agree on that, but we're going to take some message about this undefined Jesus into the hinterlands where barbarians are murdering each other, and this message of an undefined Jesus is going to make them stop killing each other, love one another, and bring peace to earth. 
I don't think so. <laughs> no, yeah, I don't think that's going to work. It's it's not going to. And 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 the and it's very it's very interesting to see that same liberal, properly liberal argument being employed by uh, certain people today who are not so cozy with the creeds, as it turns yes. out. Yeah. That I read that quote just a second ago as I was looking through uh, the article it was based off of, and I was like, "This sounds a lot like somebody I've been reading lately." Yeah, yeah. Now all that all, and we're back to all that matters is love. If we just love them, in the um, one of the videos I can't remember if it's the first or second called American Gospel, there is one young man for whom I had a certain amount of respect because he at least was being honest in saying, I reject all of this. I reject Christ. I reject the Bible. I reject the Bible's plan of salvation, as opposed to the liberal theologians who claimed they believed it and denied it with every breath. This guy's at least being honest. He says, and and so I'm rejecting it so I can go show love to people in practical ways. Um, You see, here, friend, here's the thing. If Jesus isn't who he says he is, and if what he says isn't true, and if his death is not the ultimate example of divine love, what is this thing called love that you're going to show to people? How do you mm-hmm. recognize it? What are its rules? How how does it manifest itself? How do you measure it? How do you know if you are in fact loving somebody? The Bible says that the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Um, the unbeliever thinks in his, at least superficially, that he's doing loving things when he may be destroying the world. But it makes him feel good about himself, and in his mind, it's what everybody needs, and therefore, obviously, it's loving. And yet, the Bible keeps calling us back to a love that does indeed have rules. Jesus said, um, this is love that you keep my commandments, or rather, John said it of him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And Paul said, the whole law is fulfilled in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he goes on and quotes the Ten Commandments and says, this is love. Love doesn't kill, it doesn't steal, it doesn't slander, it doesn't seduce, and it doesn't do these things either outwardly or in the heart. Uh, The fact that you feel uh, a man feels good about a woman and then tries to seduce her and claims, but it's because I loved her. No, it's not. (laughs) Whatever's going on there, that's, that's not love. That's something very different. But if the Bible's not there to tell us these things and to draw the lines, if the Bible is not authoritative truth from someone who transcends humanity and and sees around our nonsense and tells it like it is, then we don't know what love is. And we can talk all day about how loving and kind and sweet and nice we are, and it can mask the most violent, vicious kind of bloodshed and theft that the world's ever known, i.e., for instance, Marxism. And you can go in other directions as well. Yeah. Dr. Rushdoony makes this note about the um, the first four, well, first six ecumenical councils of the church. The ecumenical councils of the early church were in their purpose and nature very different from the modern councils and ecumenical efforts of the church. First, the early councils had as their primary purpose the defense and establishment of truth, not unity. Unity had to be established on the foundation of truth, not truth as the product of unity. The council Mm -hmm. came together for the purpose of conflict, the battle of truth against error, and any unity on other than the whole truth of Scripture was anathema. Second, the concern of the councils was primarily the faith, not the church. Institutionally, the church suffered because of the conflict, but theologically, Mm -hmm. it flourished and ensured its survival and growth. The modern ecumenical movement and modern councils are thus in purpose and work in direct contrast to their early councils. Their concern is with unity with the institution, not the faith primarily. In fact, not the faith at all. Jesus has warned us not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And any kind of um, covenantal situation, any kind of shared life that we swear an oath to, that's a bond. And we're not to get into those kind of arrangements with unbelievers. We, We see it generally, most Protestant Christians are well taught that the believers shouldn't marry unbelievers. But when it comes to our church joining your church, well, let's see, what basis is it on? Which doctrines are we going to agree on? When we stand together uh, on the dais or speak together from the pulpit, have we agreed that we're going to speak about the triune God who reveals himself in his incarnate Son, whose 
uh, substitutionary death for sinners is the only basis of salvation we receive by faith and faith alone. Okay, we're going to talk about that? Good. Welcome, brother. Let's go preach that. But when we say, yeah, we're going to not go near any of that because that's all divisive and offensive. We're going to toss out a lot of ooey-gooey things about love and kindness and voting the right way. Hmm. Um, yeah, no, that's... It, it is strange that we... Well, it's not strange. The devil's been working on this one for a long time. You mentioned Hegel earlier. Yeah. Um, there's there's a, a good sense, but it goes back a lot further than that. This idea, hath God said, this is old as Eden, can we really draw a line that separates the whites from the blacks? And the Bible says on every page, absolutely, God's drawn it. Now pick a side. Either side with this division between absolute truth and absolute error, or you belong to absolute error. There's no middle ground. There's no third choice. There's no other option. You either love God and accept his description of reality, uh, and that includes that there are people who hate him and those who love him, or you side with those who hate him and you make up all kinds of things, sometimes even in the name of Jesus, mm. that do not conform to reality and that lead to hell. And this is not a popular message. And it's also, just to go uh, further on the Athanasius point, one thing that, you know, so many people who are anti anti-credal, they often point at Nicaea and try unsuccessfully to make the claim, well, this was just a, you know, Constantine-influenced council, and it was all about enforcing this unity and pushing out other genuinely Christian uh, viewpoints yeah. on Christ, and yep. you know th that it, it brought about this, you know, this forced instantaneous unity. And I'm like, have you looked at any of the history? Like, yeah. Immediately <laughs> following, like they they got the creed in writing. Everyone, all the bishops voted on it. They put it down in writing. Constantine did give his seal of approval, and then like he immediately changed his mind, exiled Athanasius. Yeah, <laughs> it's like there was Athanasius, no Athanasius was exiled repeatedly. Four, and, four and all times, of those, I think. Yeah, uh, more than that, I believe. And all of those bishops who had signed, well, not all of them, I hope, but great many of them turned on on the very thing they had signed and said, well, what, what were we doing? Oh, it was that mean old Athanasian. He twisted our arm. He made us do it. I mean, what's the difference between uh, is God like God? That was, like God's good enough, isn't it? And it took it's an just entire- just one letter. Yeah, one little letter. All this fuss over one letter. And it took an entire generation of theologians after that to go back, relay the groundwork, define the terms, do the exegetical work, so that by the time the Council of Constantinople came, a generation later, everyone said, oh, that's what we're agreeing to. We got it now. But just uh, yeah, just, just because everyone says, oh, we agree with you now, watch your back. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, truth is the precursor to unity. You don't get to unity by bypassing truth. No. Cool. Well, thank you for that discussion. This was spirited and fun. Uh, do you have a recommendation? Um, uh, one that I have perused only um, slightly, but I, I know the author from other things and I trust his work. The man's name is J. Marcellus Kick. He was uh, active in the, the 40s and 50s. He wrote a book called Ecumenis Ecum Ecumenism and the Evangelical. I don't know if you can find a copy. It was published by uh, Presbyterian Reform Publishing Company back in 1958, which was the year I was born. But it is a non-scholarly, but nonetheless quite competent look at the, the ecumenical movement of the 30s and 40s and showing basically what we've been talking about, how, how the liberals spoke in the name of love and unity while trying to undercut the faith at every turn. Mm. So if you're interested in church history from that period and understanding how America got from the end of the um, 19th century of being a bunch of revivalists in a church on every corner and um, the Bible's the word of God to being Bible what, um, it, this might be worth your while. Wonderful. Um, I think in that same kind of vein, I'm going to recommend reading um, really anything by Bavink. Mm. Bavink is an incredible Dutch Reformed theologian. 
um, who's experiencing something of a renaissance uh, in in the minds <laughs> of a lot of young seminarians uh, this generation. And every time I see, I just see like scatter quotes because I don't I do not have the uh, financial standing to afford reform dogmatics in all of these four <laughs> volumes um, or the time to read it honestly. But um, every do time I have, see, do you have his doctrine of God? The first, I, it's the, oh, the, the the first volume. It's an abstract of the first volume. It's just I it's, do not. I, I have. Oh, it is so wonderful. I wish I had an extra copy. I'd send it to you. Oh, well, I'll keep my you. I'll keep my eyes open. But it is. I do it, own something by Bob Inc. I just can't remember the title. It's not. That yeah. Bad. Oh, this is this is the where where his uh, dogmatics starts. It is just mm -hmm. so many things that so many things as I read them, I went, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for instance, just just one that comes to my mind when he says the God's attributes are infinite in number. Mm. Of course they are. He's infinite. <laughs> what are we going to say? He has twelve attributes. This has always bothered me because I'd written an essay once upon the attributes of God, and I'd done a lot of studying and preparation, and I, I was a little bit amused that all of the theologians that I had read reduce the number of God's attributes to about seven or eight or nine or something like that, as if there were some very small amount that the, the Bible talked about, and that, that was it. And, and I always wonder, but where is sense of humor? Because <laughs> God has a sense of humor. You read the Bible, that's obvious. Or creativity in the sense of, of imagining beautiful and wonderful and neat things. That's, there's none of them were there. Mm -hmm. And so I'd been wondering for a long time, why aren't we? Why aren't the 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 system of system of, those who write systematic theologies? Why aren't they mentioning this? Why is their list so narrow? It was so refreshing to hear Bobbing say, "Well, there's an infinite number. You can't, <laughs> which means <laughs> you can never address all of them." But uh, yeah, well, there's some you should. Um, and sure. then his, <laughs> yeah, and then his another reference in the same book, uh, all language about God is anthropomorphic. Yes. It has to be. What else are we going to yes. use but human speech to describe uh, the divine trans, nature? The divine nature. We we don't know if if there, if there is a God language, we don't know it. All we can use is the language He's given us, which is oddly a human language and finite well, by definition. Yeah. Uh, just, so those are just a couple of the many wonderful things. His discussion of the procession of the Spirit oh, that, that's is absolutely wonderful. wonderful. So yeah, uh, you want you want to encounter somebody who insists on truth. I'm Bobbing. Reed Bobbing. Excellent, excellent choice. Uh, and and just to follow up on that as well, one of the reasons I am thinking of him in particular is because he is such an excellent antidote to the absolutely abysmal and awful 20th century Trinitarian theology. Yes, that is out there. <laughs> the 20th century is a nightmare for theology proper and Christology. Yeah, uh, I think of art mainly. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, that was just the start. And now we've got yeah. every young punk who has a seminary degree making his own speculations about the nature of God. Well, why can't God be like this? Because he's not and read the Bible. Well, the yeah. Bible says whatever you say. No. Why are it's we really so, a nonsense out of your mouth? Go away. Speaking, <laughs> speaking of that, I, I, I found an argument uh, earlier today from somebody who claimed that uh, the word mo monogenes uh -huh. or monogenes, I don't know how you actually pronounce it. I am not a Greek student, has been misunderstood. And this was coming from a supposedly conservative Baptist fellow. Has been misunderstood forever. It doesn't mean only begotten, you know, monogenes, right. generated. It means one son of the same kind, because it's from genes, a uh, genos, a kind, instead of genera, a, a generation. And I was like, yeah, so you're smarter than Augustine and all the people in the yeah. first few centuries who spoke Greek. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they all spoke yeah. about it as, in this way. It's like that. that is almost a direct line from, well, Arius, but also from <laughs> uh, the 20th century. Yeah. No. Anyway, oh. uh, so yeah, uh, I just recommend Bavink because he's an excellent uh, example of reform, a reformed systematician. There's the word. Thank you. You're welcome, <laughs> and uh, an excellent antidote as well. Pre a, a precursor, precursorial antidote to the 20th century <laughs> uh, theology discussions. Yeah. And with that, we'll draw to a close. If you'd like to, you can follow us on our YouTube channel through Rumble. 
You can like our Facebook page. Uh, and if you'd like, if you like the show and you want to subscribe to us uh, to get each episode, you can do so through any podcast catcher that's out there. We should be on all of them. If you would like to reach out to us or ask us any questions, give us suggestions for topics you would like to hear us talk about, you can email us at haltingtowardzion at gmail.com. We'd like to thank our financial supporters who helped make this show a possibility. And if you would like to join our financial supporters, uh, you can do so at anchor.fm forward slash halting towards Zion. You can help us afford all the software licenses that we use to edit the episodes. And finally, a big thank you to David Maxson, who is our producer and helps get these episodes edited to you. We hope to see you next time. Thank you again for joining us. Bye.